So I have to thank the Adult Education Committee um, who helps sponsor and the, and the Sisterhood who always very generously sponsors and of course the Brotherhood uh, that helps us with our setup. And of course most of all, most of all I'd like to thank the Shlichim whose tremendous enthusiasm and whose love of Yushalayim and the land of Israel brings us here tonight and I'm going to give the floor now over to uh, um, our chairman, Shimon Weiss. Shavuot Tov and Bruchim Abayim to our annual Yom Yerushalayim celebration in our community. My name is Shimon Weiss. Me and my wife, we are Shlichim in Tenenbaum Chat, Kimmel Campus. And we're happy to open this celebration tonight, the celebration that became tradition in our community for the past few years. This celebration shows our love to Jerusalem and to our connection to our roots as a nation. Roots starts from the time of King David around 3,000 years ago. When the 10 tribes came to David, King David, and asked him to be the king not only to his own tribe, Yehuda, that he ruled from the capital, Hebron, and be the king for all of Israel, King David made a very unique and weird decision. He decided to transfer the capital city from Hebron, that Hebron, <clears throat> that Hebron, a city with many springs that uh, go on the main road that called Dere Hebron, cities that very easy to protect. If we look about the geographic in the area of Hebron, and so many benefits around this area as a capital city, and instead of all of that, he chose to move to a place that not even on the main road that's very hard to protect in the future, that belong now to the Yevusim and you need to uh, 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 conquer this land, this city, and all of these things that not make sense. So why, why David chose to transfer his own capital city from the middle of the center of his tribe to Jerusalem? And the answer is, probably you see it now, yeah, is this map. And this map is the map of the tribes. And where is, where is Jerusalem? As you see, Jerusalem is right between Shevet Binyamin from the north and Shevet Yehuda from the south. And the, and the point that what David tried to do there, that this city don't belong to any tribes, not belong not to Binyamin, not to Yehuda. We know sources that in one of them mentioned in Binyamin, one of them mentioned in Yehuda, it means it's not belong to none of them. It belonged to all of Israel. All the purpose of this city that decision that David made, uh, made 3,000 years ago, this decision is to make unity. After a long war between Bey David and Ben Shaul, this is the time that David thought, if I want to be the king of all Am Israel, all the 12, 12 tribes, I need to find a different capital. And our capital city is Jerusalem from the moment that David chose Ir David as his own uh, uh, capital city. Now, uh, uh, what we celebrate in t celebration tonight, we celebrate in the unity around this city that started from 3,000 years ago up, up to today, and this is our celebration of love and, and support to our capital city, Yerushalayim. It would be honored to open our evening by inviting our Mara de Atra, Rabbi Koropkin, to say a Divrei Torah. Hi, Erev Tov. Good evening, everyone. Today, unfortunately, there was another pigua. There was another attack. Uh, four young students right outside the Gush at the same bus stop where the three boys were kidnapped uh, were hit by uh, an Arab driver who was just one of these lone one of these lone terrorists who was just out to be able to do as much damage as he could. Uh, we, we hope, Ezrat Hashem, that all the boys will, will recover and will be okay. But I'd like us to recite a capital to Hillam for their Rafua Shalema, and let's all keep them in mind. I don't have the names right now in front of me, but if you could just, you have the names, Moshe. 
If you could please rise, we'll say a capital to Hillam together for their Rafua Shalema. Shilama Alo Sesoina Yel Hehorim and Mayahai in Yavo Ezri Ezri Neimadunoi, you'll say Shamayim Voretz. Al Yitain Lamot Raglecha, Al Yanum Shomerecham. Ine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. Adonai shomer echa, Adonai tzilicha al yad yeminecha. Yom ha-mashemesh lo yakeka v'yarei ach baloylam. Adonai yishmor echa mikol ra, yishmor es nafshecha. Adonai yishmor tzei secho voecha meyata aviyad olam. Mishaber achavu sein Avram Yitzchak v'yakov Moshe Aharon David u'shlomo u'yivarech v'yirapei es ha'chulim v'es ha'peguim. Bavur shanachnu mispalalim bavuram. B'schazer ha'kadosh baruchu yimalei rachamim aleihem l'achalimam u'l'raposam u'l'achazikam u'l'achiyosam. Yishlach lohem mehira rufuah shalema min ha'shamayim L'chol ivareim u'l'chol gideihem b'toch sh'archol ha'Yisrael. Rafua sanefesh or rafua saguf, hashta ba'agalav izman kariv in Omar Amen. So, welcome everyone. Happy Yom Yerushalayim which is really mukdam, because Yom Yerushalayim really will, uh, officially is Chavchet Iyar, which will be on Sunday. But it's uh, commemorated, celebrated uh, tonight, and, uh, uh, tonight, today. And I was, um, I was watching a video today that was sent to me from uh, Yeshivat B'nai David, that I have a very nice Kesher with. Where's Lior Stuhl's daughter? I heard she's here. Hi. We never met. I feel bad we never met. But I'm very good friends with your father. And, um, and uh, who's the director of the yeshiva. And the yeshiva made a beautiful video this year uh, about Miriam Peretz. Miriam Peretz uh, is a very, very brave and heroic woman. She goes and speaks. She's written a book about her experiences, and she goes and speaks for various different Jewish organizations, both in Israel and outside of Israel. She lost two sons. At, she, has six, she had six children, and she lost two sons to wars in Israel. She lost her son, Uriel Peretz, in the Lebanon in 1998, and she lost her son, Eliraz Peretz, in 2010 in Aza. She's one of the founders of the Givat Zev community uh, outside of Yerushalayim. And so this very short, this 10-minute video was all about uh, Miriam Peretz um, uh, being one of the inaugurators of a ceremony to celebrate Yerushalayim. And then it takes her on a walking tour to her favorite places in, uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And she goes to all of these different places, uh, she goes to, she of course, to visit the, the Churva synagogue in the old city, and she sees life, and she sees vibrancy and children running through the cobblestone streets. And she looks out at the Kotel Plaza, and she says, whenever I visit the Kotel, I know that every stone that I step on was acquired through Jewish blood. And so, of course, for her, it's, uh, she says it with so much more meaning and so much more significance. But as I'm reading this book, Like Dreamers, about the 1967 Six-Day War and about how we retook Jerusalem and there was such, just such, so much chaos in these narrow, labyrinthine streets of, uh, of Jerusalem, I can only, uh, I, you, you can't look at the Kotel Plaza in any other way than to realize that every step that we step on, no matter how clean and no matter how beautiful it looks, we have to remember that every stone was acquired through Jewish blood. She went up to Har Herzl, where her two sons are buried. And her biggest problem is, she says, whenever I come up here, I don't know which son to hug first. 
which, which kever I should go to first. And so she has to consult with the Ribbono Sholalam every time she goes to her Herzl and switch off. And then she went to uh, the kever of Shmuel Hanavi, and which is overlooking, you know, you go up to Ramot and you continue driving, you get to this hill where the traditions tells us that the grave of Shmuel Hanavi is. And you hear this woman on the video with such great strength saying, you know, the Hilula, she's a Moroccan, she says the yard site of Shmuel Hanavi is on the 28th of, uh, of Iyar. It's no, uh, it's no coincidence that it's on, it's on the day of Yom Yerushalayim. Because who was Shmuel Hanavi? He was the person who anointed David HaMelech. And as you just heard from, heard from Shimon, it was David HaMelech who was the one who moved the capital city of the Jewish people to Yerushalayim. Ultimately, because Shmuel Hanavi was responsible for Jerusalem to be our capital, so it's no coincidence that his yard site is on Chavchet Iyar, so that when Jews celebrate the taking of the, the founding of Yerushalayim and the city of Yerushalayim and the, the unification of the city of Yerushalayim, it could be hearkening back to the very first person who was responsible for getting us in Yerusha, to Yerushalayim in the first place. And so these are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you about this amazing woman, Miriam Peretz, and about her journey and her connection to the city of Yerushalayim. And it's because of people like her who made such an ultimate sacrifice that we can ill afford to, be, um, to not take Yom Yerushalayim seriously, to remember the blood that was spilled on this day so that you and I can go to the beautiful hotels and to the Kotel Plaza and to the Old City and to the Churva Synagogue and to all of the beautiful places and restaurants and yeshivas and seminaries where we send our children because of, because of the Peretz family and because of so many people like them. But the ability to be able to connect back to the city of Yerushalayim, Eino Shel Olam, the, the, the center of the universe, the place of the Shekhinah, the only thing that we're currently missing is the Har Habayit, but that too will one day, hopefully very, very soon, we will have full access to Har Habayit and be able to have full control of the entire city of Yerushalayim. And finally, uh, Yom Yerushalayim for me, since moving to Toronto, some years it's very happy and some years it's bittersweet because Yom Yerushalayim to me sort of demarcates uh, the, the last event of the calendar year that is so um, instrumentally orchestrated by our shlichim. And so some years it's great because no one leaves. <laughs> but this year we have three families of our shlichim who are departing and this sadly is the last event and uh, I've spoken to some of them who are, have already started to get packing. And uh, it's, uh, you know, for me personally, I have to tell you, the, the Shushan family, the Weiss family, the Borofsky family. Oi, Boaz. Boaz, Boaz, Boaz. Who's going to play? Who's going to play for us? And, and, uh, and each, one of the, each one of these families that, that really touched all of our lives for a short period of time. But each, one, each family, each, the, each, each couple, each, each husband and wife is a gem. Really such a gem, such a jewel that we were Zoha to have in our community for two years, three years, four years. Whatever it was, um, we're very, very grateful. You always know that it's, you know, you're going to have to say goodbye. So there's a certain part of you that says, uh, I'll be nice to you, but I don't want to become so much your friend because I hate saying goodbye. But it's too difficult not to become friends with such special people. And so uh, we'll, Bezrat Hashem, we'll visit you in Yerushalayim. We'll reunite uh, this coming year, if God willing, if we have another mission, we'll reunite with you in the King Solomon Hotel in Yerushalayim. And uh, I won't say goodbye. I'll just say thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you.
Yerushalayim Aiti Shkach Yemini Everyone Tidvak Lishoni Ailechi Share a deal. 
Thank you very much. I'm singing the Divrei Torah. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my partners, the Shlichim, that took part of this celebration, and the people who held behind and between these scenes. Ariel and Oshrat Irani, Effie and Shalom Krell, Michael and Adas Shushan, Boaz and Oshrit Borovsky, Dina Weiss, Rinat and Noam Armon, and above all, Rabbi Shmuel Silberg, yeah. Silberg, of his marvelous support and outstanding effort, not only in bringing this evening to life, but for being a strong link between the Shlichim Ledorotehem and the Bait, being our Shaliach in the Bait. Now I would like to invite Mr. Jory Vernon, Vice Principal in Tenenbaum Chat Wallenberg Campus, to bring to give us a lecture about the Islamic claim to Jerusalem, fact or fiction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm happy to stick around afterwards. I don't have enough time to really give the full uh, extent of what I wanted to say normally, but I'm happy to stay and answer any questions if I'm not clear on anything. Um, so thank you for having me very much, and it's really an honor to be here for Yom Yerushalayim, and it's a pleasure. It's all mine, so I really appreciate it, and thanks to the Iranis for inviting me and having me here. So the question becomes, as we hear today, we know, I think most of us are aware that uh, Jerusalem is the third holiest city in Islam behind Mecca and Medina. The question becomes, why? Where does that come from, that designation? If it's the third holiest city in the religion, it has to be important. It can't be random. It has to be legitimate. It has to be significant. Is that the case? And that's what we're going to try to look at today and examine a little bit. Is that the case? If we look at, I can't really see the pictures, but the first picture is up there. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if I need a mic for this. Either. That is your typical picture. I think all of us, if you've been there, you've taken this picture yourself. I was looking through my pictures sometimes, different times I've been there, and I have this picture probably 20 times. It's a classic, and it shows, of course, the Kotel, and it shows the beautiful Dome of the Rock. Many of us, when we think of Jerusalem, this picture comes to mind. Our story today doesn't have anything to do with either the Kotel or the Dome of the Rock. It has nothing to do with it. We can go to the next picture, please. It has to do with that mosque over there, on the Harabai, okay? That is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's a, your eyes don't necessarily go there because it's, not, it's attracted by the beautiful gold, by the way, the gold has only been there since the 1960s. 1960s, King Hussein of Jordan made it. Made it gold. He didn't build the mosque, he made it gold. That is the silver or gray mosque, Al-Aqsa. And that is where our story begins. The Islamic claim is that is on that very spot of Al-Aqsa that Muhammad ascended to heaven on Al-Burak, a winged animal, we sometimes hear that the winged horse, it's not really clear that it was a horse, Barak, some kind of winged animal. He went up to heaven, there he met all of the prophets, Jesus and Moses and so on, and he met Allah, met God. He negotiated how many times they would pray a, a true devout Muslim. It's the time when Islam became the only pure, true religion. And he came back to heaven, he descended, on that very spot as well. If that's the case, then I'm done. Because it seems very clear that of course it's a very holy place. Of course it has steeped in tradition. And of course it makes perfect sense that it would be the third holiest place behind Mecca and Medina in Islam. But I'm not done. So if I'm not done, silly to come here and just do that. 
then what's the story behind it? And that's what I want to examine a little bit more today. Okay? Remember the name, please. The Al-Aqsa Mosque. The silver one on the other side. Al-Aqsa. It's an important part of the story. We have, in Hebrew, 72 names for Jerusalem. Okay? It is mentioned in the Torah 349 times by one of those names. 349 times. That is also 349 more times than Jerusalem in any of its names is mentioned in the Quran. It is not mentioned once in the Quran. It is mentioned in the Hadith. Okay? The difference between the Quran and the Hadith is important. The Quran is supposedly what Allah, what God, through the angel Gabriel, told to Muhammad over years as the true religion. The Hadith is the sayings that attributed to Muhammad. Okay? The Mishnah, for example, right? That's what this is. So the Hadith does mention Jerusalem, the sayings of Muhammad. And this is also very important, what the Hadith is. The Quran itself, directly from God through the angel Gabriel to his messenger Muhammad, it is not mentioned once. That's got to be a curious circumstance and fact. Okay? Even many of the names in Arabic are very similar and would connotate for us a Jewish connection, even in Arabic. For example, one of the names is Bayt al-Mikdas. Okay? Bayt, al- Bayt al-Makdis, actually. Okay? Bayt al-Mikdash in Hebrew. Bayt al-Makdis. They still refer to that today. Okay? There are a number of names. Ilya, for example. If you know your history of Jerusalem, in Roman times, Ilya Capitolina it was called. The Romans just took it from the Arabic Ilya. But the fact remains that it is not mentioned at all in the Quran. So how did we get to this point today where we are acknowledging, I guess, for most of us, that it's the third holy city in Islam and that we've seen in any kind of attempted peace treaty with Arabs, Palestinians, I want to call them that, Jerusalem, non-negotiable, it must be the capital of a Palestinian state. Okay? Jews have said that you've got capitals all over the place. we got one. Let us have one. No, it's too holy to us. It's so important. It's so integral to Islam that you can't have it. We have to have it. So where does this come from? Okay? That's important. We know quite a bit, I guess, about the story of Muhammad when he was alive. And we know what he wanted and whether we accept it or not is another story. Our problems begin partially after the death of Muhammad when there's a split. Most of you are aware of a Sunni-Shia split in Islam, I would imagine. And these are some of the problems that we're going to get into that create our story. Okay, But what happens is this. Muhammad spreads the word of Islam bit by bit. He proselytizes and he goes from place to place to place trying to convince either through words or when those fail through the sword. You remember a previous pope got into a lot of trouble for saying that Islam was spread by the sword, which tells me they don't know their history because Islam was spread by the sword. There's no denying that. If they know the history, their own history, they can't deny that. When Muhammad goes, sometimes he's successful, sometimes he's not. Sometimes people believe him and accept him. Other times they do it with their heads chopped off. Other times they tell him to go away and he usually comes back in battle. And he's been very successful in battle. There's one story that's very important to us. And if we could just go to, I think, the next slide, Oshlat, please. Okay, that's just the aerial view. That's not the one. Okay, you can see that. This is the one. And I just want to come up here. This is Mecca. 
And there's a place here called Ha'if. Okay, Mecca, this little diamond, this little diamond here is called Ta'if. To get from Mecca to Ta'if is a two-day walk in those days. Okay? There were no go trains or anything like that in those days. Two-day walk to get from Mecca to Ta'if. You can't see it on this map, but there's a place in between, a small village in between. Muhammad knew that if he stayed overnight in the desert by himself, some animal, either with four legs or with two legs, is probably going to kill him. He had a small village in between Mecca and Ta'if where he had friends. It was already Islamicized, they had embraced Islam, and he had a friend's place that he could stay at. Again, in this map you don't see it at all, but there's a river that runs near Ta'if, through Ta'if. In this place, there were two mosques. Everybody hear me if I don't have any? Yeah, good. Not my teacher voice. There were two mosques. <coughs> they were called the Close Mosque and the Far Mosque. There was no naming contest or anything. The Close Mosque and the Far Mosque. Near where Muhammad was staying at his friend's house, was, he was close to the Close Mosque. Muhammad knew if I only go to the close mosque, I'm Muhammad. I'm going to bring Shah Shanda to the far mosque. Even though it's a bit of a schlep, I don't know if he spoke Yiddish or not, but maybe. <laughs> I'm going to go also, I'm praying five times a day anyway, I'm also going to make a point, Nafka, to go to the far mosque. I want everyone to see Muhammad, the prophet, goes to the close mosque. And Muhammad goes to the far mosque. Okay? Why is this important? It's crucial. I'm going to tie a couple of things together right now. In Arabic, far mosque is al aqsa. It means literally the far mosque, al aqsa. Muhammad. It, there is in the Quran that Muhammad went to Al-Aqsa and went up to heaven. It does not say Jerusalem. It does say from Al-Aqsa, from the far mosque. It's crucial that we understand that. So then how do we get from the far mosque, somewhere in between Mecca and Ta'if, in what is today Saudi Arabia, to Jerusalem? Now we have to go back a step, literally, to the point where Muhammad's dead and Islam splits. In the split of Shia and Sunni, there's a question today even, it hasn't been resolved at all, as to who is the rightful heir to Islam, the caliph, the next leader of Islam. Sunnis believe one thing, Shia believe another. Okay? Do, do, I have it up there, a little chart. We have the, I don't know where it is. No? More, more? There we go. Okay? That's what it is. So Muhammad dies in 632. You have Abu Bakr, who is a friend and collaborator with Muhammad. Those who believe that he is the next rightful heir are called Sunni. There are those who believe Ali. Ibn Abi Talib, who is a cousin and son-in-law, you deal with that, of Muhammad who is, if you believe Ali is, then it's the Shi then you are a Shiite. There's no question that Ali was a caliph. Question is, was he the first caliph or the fourth caliph, what the Sunnis believe? They don't doubt he was a caliph, the Sunnis believe he's number four, not number one. Or not number two after Muhammad. Okay? So that's the question. Comes down. Now, eventually. If you can go, I can leave it up there, it doesn't matter. Okay? We, both sides are talking about, we are the right ones, you're wrong. The Sunnis, the Shia, no, we're right, you're wrong. And that battle still, as I say, still to this day has never been resolved. In order to substantiate their claim, I'm right, and I'll prove it. There is hadith. Remember the hadith? This, the utterings and speeches of, of Muhammad. There's hadith 
to support what we say. The other side says, yeah, I got more hadith than you to support what I say. And they out hadithed each other. I've just created a new word. Just to give you a perspective on what was going on at that time, hundreds of years later, when the hadith was probably enough to fill this beautiful room, Islamic scholars realized it can't all be right. There's no chance. He wouldn't have shut up if he'd have said everything that we were attributing to him. They, the real hardcore Islamic scholars went in and sifted through mountains and mountains of hadith to try to ascertain which is legitimate and which is not. What they found was about 90, 90% of what was considered to be hadith was in fact not. All forgery. All things people made up to substantiate whatever claims they had. It's bogus. 90%. How do we know the 10% is legit? Because they said so. He never bothered to sign the bottom. Of course, illiterate people don't sign very often. And they just assumed, yeah, this sounds like it, like he would have said that. Not that any of them met them. He'd been dead for hundreds of years before they decided this. But they attribute, what they attributed, yeah, this sounds good. We'll keep that as legit. 90% got thrown out. Okay? Then our story goes a little bit. The other stories of, of times in Jerusalem where we'll get to a little bit about Islamic rulers and scholars never going to Jerusalem, never going up to these mosques, never attributing anything to it at all. But one of the caliphs, a little bit later, moves the capital from Mecca of the Arab world, from Mecca in the Islamic world, to Damascus. If we can go... I have a, I'm not, oh, no, I'm back one. Yeah, no, one more. Forward. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Damascus. Okay? At that point, he's, I say, conquering by the sword, this caliph divides the men into two armies and sends those two armies, strong, powerful armies, in two directions to conquer, to both spread Islam and also to bring back war booty, make money. In those days, when you went out to war, you went out to war. You didn't come back so fast. 90% of the population of Damascus at that time was female. 90% female. And 10% very happy, lucky men. You can imagine what was going on in Damascus with a population of 90% female and 10% male. We know today, for example, that Muhammad, or Islam, I mean, does not permit the drinking of alcohol. You can't even make a lachaim. You don't drink alcohol if you're a devout Muslim. Interesting little side note where that comes from. Muhammad, like others before and after, was desperate to try to convert the Jews to Islam. He had encountered many, many Jews. The Banu Quraysh, for example, near his tribe in there, there were large Jewish communities in, in that part of the world, of which now there are none, of course. And... And for example, one of the things he tried to convince them, to induce the Jews to accept, was that they were going to pray toward Jerusalem. When the Jews said, yeah, we're good, thank you. We're happy with what we've got. We're, we, we wish you the good luck, but go away. He decrees that they will no longer pray toward Jerusalem, but they're going to pray toward facing Mecca, as they do today. Think what that means. Somebody who lives in what today we call sometimes the West Bank, when he prays, his tochus is facing Jerusalem. Think what that means of, of, on the level of respect. The other thing that he got Muhammad so angry against, because the Jews would not embrace Islam, many of the Jews of the Banu Quraysh and other tribes, of the Arabian tribes that were Jewish, were in the liquor business. 
You thought Samuel Bronfman was the first. He wasn't. And in order to punish the Jews, he decreed that a Muslim does not drink alcohol. Take away the business. That's how he's going to punish the Jews. This doesn't come from Allah. It doesn't come through the angel Gabriel. It's a punishment because the Jews refuse to accept Islam. Okay? When they're now in Damascus, and one of the reasons they moved the capital to Damascus was that he didn't have to, by, by separating himself from Damascus, so, sorry, from uh, Mecca, he could take some liberties with the religion. And as I said, with 90% female, 10% male, you can imagine what went on there, including a lot of imbibing with alcohol. Once a year, the people of Damascus, under the caliph, would make a hajj, a pilgrimage, to Mecca. They'd walk around the Kaaba, they would sanctify, purify their souls. And good, we're good. I don't know if there's any al khaits there or not, but maybe, I wasn't there. With that, eventually, the keepers of the Kaaba around Mecca started saying, you know, we're not too happy with the way you're doing things here. The idea is not to live 364 days in sin and then one day purify yourself. The idea is to live a devout life according to our traditions and our, and our laws. You can't do that. You can't come next. Either you live pure and sanctified all year long and then do a hajj or don't come back. Weighing the two things, kind of like Tevya, he decides on one hand, on the other hand, I'll stick with what I got, thank you. It's too much fun. But, how do they purify their souls? How do they get righteous to Allah? How do they become clean living in impure sin for almost the entire year? They change where they're going to make a hajj. Jerusalem from Damascus is, I don't want to say a stone's throw because that's almost literal with our cousins, what they're doing, but it's very, very close. They can't go back to Mecca, so they go to Jerusalem. So how do you justify Jerusalem? What is this place, Jerusalem? As we heard so beautifully, it really wasn't much at the beginning. What are we going to do there? How do we justify that? How am I going to pull this off? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the story of Al-Aqsa. It doesn't say where it is. It just says the far mosque. Azai, I'll make it in Jerusalem. How am I going to pull that part off? Hadith. I will get Hadith, which identifies Jerusalem. Remember I said that Jerusalem is mentioned in the Hadith. So this is where the story comes from, that Muhammad went to Jerusalem, to that specific spot of Al-Aqsa Mosque on today, on the Harabayt, and he ascended to the heavens to meet Allah and the other prophets. And he had the Hadith to back it up. And well, okay, if, if this is what Muhammad said, and this makes sense, and we know the story of Al-Aqsa, nowhere is it identified precisely where it is. So I'm going to say it's in Jerusalem. And remember I said at the beginning, if the story is true, that he ascended to heaven from Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, Dayenu, then it's okay, it's legit. I ask you now, how legitimate is it? Where does this come from? The story is fabricated. The story is created out of nothing, out of convenience. A long time ago. But it has no substantiation or legitimacy in what it is. I'm going to provide you with a couple of other examples to support what I've just said. What are the next? Yeah, okay. What you have there is a picture of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in 1880. Okay, 150 whatever years ago. 1880, this is Al-Aqsa. If you look, here, 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 all over the place, that's weeds and grass, everything growing. What does that tell you? That 
this is the holiest place, the third holiest place in our religion. Okay? Think of the Kotel today and how immaculate and how beautiful and how it's been done when the Jews took it back in 67, what we did to it, what they did to it, now what we've done to it. They've got full control here, people. They can go any time they want. They could have done anything they wanted to clean this up. It looks terrible. It's in disrepair. It's falling apart. Why? Because they're not going there. Why aren't they going there? Why would we go there? It's not as pretty as the other one. I don't even know what it means, so why would I bother going? If it was that important, they would go. If anyone's been to Jerusalem, have you ever seen Jews at the Kotel? Maybe once or twice. Because it's so important to us. It's in our neshama. That's why we have a Yom Yerushalayim. It's so important. We've done everything we can to it. Right? Mishkach at Yerushalayim. If we ever forget thee, we know the consequences if we ever forget in Jerusalem. We won't. This is how important Al-Aqsa is. It's in disrepair, it's falling apart, it looks awful. We know that all of this area of the old city of Jerusalem was in Arab hands until June 1967. Up until June 1967, anyone who was Arab, Muslim, could have gone Anywhere they wanted there. Dome Iraq, Al-Aqsa, they could have gone to Al-Aqsa all the time. It's so important. It's everything in our religion, of course. I'm going to name for you now every single Arab leader who went to Al-Aqsa Mosque as a leader of one of the Muslim Arab states before June 1967. Anybody want to repeat the names? <laughs> Think about this. If this is so important to them, if this is the third holiest site, this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven. He met Allah. It's the place where Islam became sanctified as the only true religion. And nobody cares. Nobody wants to go see it. Nobody wants to visit. Nobody wants to pay their respects. No one wants to have the COVID to go there and say, ah, look at me. I'm at Al-Aqsa Mosque. I must be important. Nobody. They don't go. Period. When does this start becoming important? Right after the most beautiful words are uttered by the paratroopers who took over Hal Habayt Bayadinu. Think about that too. The comparison. When the paratroopers, the Tzanchanim, take over the old city of Jerusalem from the Jordanian legionnaires and they radio in that they've got control, what do they say? They don't say, Yerushalayim Bayadinu, Jerusalem's in our hands. They don't say, Ha'ilha Atika Bayadinu, the old city's in our hands. They don't say, Reva Yehudi Bayadinu, they don't say the Jewish quarter's in our hands. What do they say? Hal Habayit Biadenu. The Temple Mount is in our hands. That's how important. That beautiful, beautiful picture you all have on this beautiful, stunning centerpieces on your tables of the three soldiers there. It's one of the most famous pictures. And then Rav Shlomo Gorin comes with the shofar. Today, I, I, I see it, I still get goosebumps. Look at how important and what it means to us. We can't give Jerusalem back. We can't accept the story that they've got just as legitimate a claim as we do. Because it's simply not true. Thank you.
Thank you very much to Mr. Renon about marvelous lecture. Yeah, I deserve it.